trying to decide whether to do an activity this morning or not, I'll go ahead and, and skip it and just tell a story instead. Um, when Kara and I were leading up to getting married, we went on a date up in the gorge. It was by Multnomah Falls, and we hiked up, and I don't know if you're supposed to these days, but we went off trail to an overlook. So we're, we're laying down on the ground with our heads over a cliff, looking at this amazing vista of the Columbia Gorge. We're laying about a foot and a half away from each other, and like you do, we started playing a game of I Spy. So I spy something blue, I spy something green, and then Kara goes ahead and she says it. I spy something white. The clouds? No. Um, the horizon line? No. Uh, the wave caps on the Columbia River? Nope. A truck on 84. No, the white lines on 84? No. Mount St. Helens? No. Um, and I proceeded to guess everything that even in some world remotely looked like the color white. And after a while, Kara starts chuckling because I'm not getting it. And then she starts full out laughing at me. And I'm getting frustrated. I'll just <laughs> be really frustrated by this. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I have guessed every possible thing there is to guess that, that's white within my view. And finally I give up and she looks at me. She's like, the waterfall, like Multnomah Falls, it's right there. And I tell her, I can't see the waterfall. From where I'm lying, just, just a foot or two away from her, it is not within my view at all. I was, I was doomed from the start. And so she's, she's dying and I'm angry and, and all I needed was a change in perspective. But, but changes in perspective are, are hard to come by some days. And, and sometimes you don't even know that you can't see something. We're going to be in Acts 9 and it's a, a passage all about seeing this morning. And I don't remember the last time we had, you know, handouts, paper, and pen for you guys. It's been a few years, but I made, made them this morning. So on the back of the announcement page is some, there are no, some notes so that you can track along. There's a few fill-in-the-blank answers. Um, but we are going to be in Acts 9, and just to remind you, the church has been born. Jesus Christ has been sent by God. He has um, taught about the coming of God's kingdom. He has been killed. He has risen from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to the church. But all did not stay well. Um, persecution and, and people opposing the name of Jesus began to arise in Jerusalem. And it came to a head when a guy named Stephen accused the religious hierarchy of totally ignoring God and his word and his messengers, just like their ancestors have always done. And so these religious elites drag Stephen out of the town and they stoned him to death. And to give themselves a little bit more arm room to, to throw rocks, they took their coats off and they put them at the feet of a guy named Saul. It's our first introduction to this character from history, sometime between AD 30, AD 43. Um, and Saul is standing there, glad to see Stephen being killed. And that day, this violent persecution arises in Jerusalem. The church is scattered. People are running for their lives. And Saul, like a first century version of the Gestapo, is going from house to house, terrorizing people, arresting men and women, and throwing them into prison. But of course, the story didn't end in defeat. The scattering of the people of God led to the gospel being shared with Samaritans, with people in Judea. The church is actually spread through this persecution. It's what we saw in Acts chapter 8. But here in Acts 9, we come back to Saul. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him, he said. And he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there, who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So this guy is one scary religious zealot. He looks at these followers of Jesus, and they are a, a blight upon Israel, a, a cancer that must be removed. So he asks for letters. 
so that he can travel 200 miles north to the town of Damascus, just in case there's any followers of the way, and then drag them back to Jerusalem to put them on trial. He's a scary guy. But as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Who are you? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And now get up and go into the city. You will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. All right, so reading the narrative, this is the first scene. The setting is a road to Damascus. The main characters are Saul and Jesus. And the conflict is that Saul is persecuting Jesus. And of course, the result is that Saul is blinded. He can no longer see. We have a problem in our story. We come to scene two. Now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. And the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, He has seen a man named Ananias come, place his hands on him to restore his sight. So what is Jesus telling Ananias to do? To go heal Saul's eyes. Lord? Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. (laughs) A Jesus? Do you know who this guy is? He's not a good dude. You know, maybe leaving him blind isn't the worst thing that could happen. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias went to the house. All right, you guys got in your notes. Scene two, setting in Damascus in a a house, assumingly. The main characters here, Ananias and Jesus. It's our second vision. The conflict, Jesus wants Ananias to heal Saul's blindness. But Ananias objects based on what he knows about Saul's past. Everyone's been talking to me about this guy, Jesus. He's no good. He's our enemy. But Jesus overrules Ananias because of what he knows about Saul's future. I know his past, but I've chosen him. He's going to carry my name and suffer for my name. Go. Which brings us to scene three. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. Let me just stop there because we'll, we'll miss it. You see what happened? Don't, don't miss this. Ananias just went from telling Jesus, this guy is no good. He's scary. He's our enemy. And now he's laying his hand on this guy and he called him brother. Ananias has had a change in perspective. His enemy has become family. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road that you were, when you were coming here, he sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. The scene 
technically ends there, but I'm going to read a little bit longer. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished, and they asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? And yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. All right, scene three, here we go. Setting is in a house in Damascus, literally in a house of Judas on Straight Street. You can Google this, and they'll, they'll tell you that, yeah, the street is still in existence in Damascus in Syria to this day. Uh, the main characters are Ananias and Saul, and the, re- the plot resolves with Saul being able to see. Literally, like he was blind, and now he can physically see. But more than that, figuratively, metaphorically, Saul was blind. He was on his way to persecute people of the way. When he encountered Jesus, who is the way, and now Saul's on the way too. Saul has now seen the truth about Jesus, and he has now joined with the people that he came to arrest. His eyes have been healed. He has a change in perspective. And of course, it's not just Saul. Ananias, too, his eyes have been changed. He went from seeing an enemy to seeing a brother. And why did these two people have changes in perspective? How were they able to see? It's because they saw Jesus first. Now, scene four, I'm going to skip a couple verses. Saul has to run for his life out of Damascus, and he goes down to Jerusalem. This is verse 26. And when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believing that he really, not believing that he really was a disciple. So again, the disciples in Jerusalem who have been, had people they love, you know, get ransacked and arrested by Saul, they don't believe that he's a good guy. He's still an enemy. But Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement, he took him and he brought him to the apostles and he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. And so Saul stayed with them. And he moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus. And he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him, which will be a theme in Saul's life. And when the believers, or literally when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and they sent him off to Tarsus. The reason I I say brothers... (coughs) Yeah, believers, but we have another story of people who went from being disciples to being brothers, people who went from seeing Saul as an enemy to seeing him as family, people who used to run for their life from the guy to now helping him run for his life. Their perspective changed, and how? It's because Barnabas saw what Jesus had done in Saul's life. Barnabas helped others to see it too. There's a change in perspective. So setting in Jerusalem, main characters Barnabas and Saul. I actually don't know if I put this on your sheet or not. Plot conflict, disciples see Saul as an enemy, and the disciples have become brothers to Saul, and they help him. And the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened. And living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. It's prospering. This is a good thing. So how do we see others differently? How do we see our enemies differently? And and let's be honest, we all have them. Some of us are too nice to ever admit that we actually have enemies. Rather, we have people that we struggle with. We have people that when they show up or when their name is mentioned, our, our blood pressure might rise a little bit. Maybe they're standing in the way of us achieving our goals. Or no, maybe we just honestly hate them. Maybe they really are true enemies to us. Maybe we're scared when they show up. Maybe they frighten us, whoever they may be. 
whether these are people at work that we can't get along with. Maybe these are our neighbors that make our homes difficult places to exist. Maybe these are people on the opposite side of the political aisle from us or with different perspectives on how this whole COVID thing should go along or you fill in the blank. There are people that we struggle with. How do we see them differently? How do we see them the way that Jesus sees them? Because the story shows that there are people (coughs) that we would write off but that God actually wants to write his story on. They're people that we want to avoid, but God actually wants to bring them and make them part of his family. He wants, he wants us to have a relationship with them. How do we see people differently? How do we get a change in perspective? Same way the guys in our stories did, by seeing Jesus first. We saw this earlier in the book of Acts. Peter on the day of Pentecost stands up and he tells all, you know, the crowd that had gathered for the festival. He says, you guys need to see Jesus. I mean, you saw him, you saw his miracles, you saw his wonders and you killed him, but God raised him from the dead and he is Lord and Christ whom you murdered. And they went, oh no, what should we do? And Peter replied, repent, be baptized each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you see Jesus as he is for who he is, like Saul, if you come to recognize he is the Son of God, you too can be saved. You can too can be part of what God is doing in human history and experience his salvation and his kingdom and his blessings and his promise. And it all hinges on Jesus. Do you see him? And of course, it doesn't doesn't stay there. It's all about seeing Jesus. The Apostle John, in his first letter, um, 1 John 3, says this, Dear friends, we're called God's children now, and what one day we will be, it has not yet been revealed. But this is we know. When Jesus appears, we will be like him, because we will see him as he is. So the hope, Jesus ascended into heaven, he's coming back one day, and John is saying, when that happens, we're going to be like Jesus, because we will see him. And in the meantime, the author of Hebrews tells us, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. What are we going to do in the meantime? Keep looking at Jesus. Keep seeing him And become more and more like him. Let him change our perspectives. We need to see Jesus because seeing Jesus enables us to see others differently. Seeing Jesus, seeing the one who died for his enemies so that his enemies can now become his family will change our perspective with the people that we struggle with, with the people that we have a hard time getting along with. But we can't see others differently until we see Jesus first. So here's my questions for you. Like, what would happen to us? What would happen to me if I saw this person, whoever they may be, the way that Jesus did? Or or maybe the question is, like Barnabas, like, am I able to help others see this person the way that Jesus does? Well, what would happen? And what should I do about it if this were really true if this if this person had had a place in the family of god if this person had a place in the program and plan of god if this (laughs) enemy if this guy that as he is right now i'm scared to death of actually might be someone through whom jesus wants to work what should i do about that See, in 2006, um, a guy named Steve Saint wrote a book called The End of the Spear. Some of you guys may remember it. It became a movie, and it was about Steve's dad and his family. See, Steve's dad, Nate Saint, working with some other missionaries, one named Jim Elliott, was trying to bring the gospel to a tribe in South America called the Alka people. And unfortunately, early in their ministry, all five of these missionaries were killed by the tribe. And there was a great publicity, there was an uproar in the United States that this had happened, but Steve's mom 
and uh, Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth, didn't give up on the mission to these people. And two years later, they moved in with the tribe. So Steve, at the age of 10, moved into the village with the guy who had killed his own father. And as an adult, Steve is touring the U.S., telling his story. And he brings up on stage the Alka man, the, the guy who killed his own dad. The tribal man that his kids call grandpa. Because of Jesus, who enabled them to see their enemies differently. They've become family. And when we see our enemies differently because of Jesus, we invite the world to see Jesus too. But of course, what about us? This is a a Google Maps screenshot of the area just really close in here to this building where we're sitting this morning. And I don't know what you see. Is it just a town? Is it a place? Is it, is it a place that God wants to bring his good news into? Is this a canvas where God might draw his next masterpiece? Or is this a broken place filled with a lot of broken people? Someone asked me this week, you know, about conflict in my life, especially over the last couple of years working here at the church. Like, who do I struggle with? And I had to own that the people who have caused me the greatest amount of stress in these last couple years um, can be generally categorized by homeless. And this is just, th- this is me, this is where I'm at, and this is where I'm, I'm struggling. But over the last several years, it has been homeless people that have broken into the building, that have left things um, unsavory and unsafe, and sometimes just downright dangerous on the property where my kids like to run and play. They have, uh, you know, shed trash and sometimes rarely but it has happened like just made me feel really unsafe and if I'm honest I have to say they are people that I struggle to see the way that Jesus does sometimes but because I see Jesus I'm trying to see them trying to see them as men and women that God may want to do a masterpiece Men and women that God may want to save, people to notice, to not write off. Though, yes, there are are boundaries to put in place and and ways to try to make it safe here for me to not look past them, to not ignore them, to not treat them as simply a problem to be solved, uh, as someone to be like, you know, meet their needs so I can feel good about myself, but rather to see them the way that Jesus does. And I wish I could say that I have arrived. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, that it, like, let me tell you guys how to do it. But I, if I'm honest, I'm in process <laughs> and I'm working on it one day at a time because I've seen Jesus and I know that he sees these people differently than I do. And, and I'm trying. And I look around this neighborhood at, at all the transitions that are taking place. And again, I'm, I'm praying and asking God, give me your eyes to see this place, to see the people who are here, to see how, what are you doing and how can I get behind it? Because if I'm honest, most of, the, most of the time, I need a change in perspective. I think we all might. So let Jesus be the one we keep in front of our eyes. Let him be the one who will enable us to see others differently. And maybe, just maybe, if we see our enemies differently, we can invite the world to see Jesus too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, gracious and good God, we, we pray for eyes to see. We pray that you would help us to keep Jesus in front of our own eyes as, as the one that we love and adore and follow and serve and are captivated by. Let him uh, be the one that we keep looking to, to show us what, what life is about, to, to show us the glory of God as, as he lays down his life for those who are his enemies who forgives those who are killing him and who even as the risen Lord intercedes for a broken world and on behalf of his people. Father, will you help us to become more like Jesus today? Will you give us eyes to see others the way that you see them? And Holy Spirit, will you enable us to walk the path of love that Jesus walked and that he has told us to walk too? 
Father, we need your Holy Spirit to help us to do this today. So be praised, God. Be glorified in Jesus Christ and in the church and, and through the, the men and women and children here. Amen.